who are uh, following us on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Twitter, or Facebook. <laughs> this is a special kind of live stream. I'm here with uh, uh, John Helmer, and um, he's actually going to um, interview um, me in the context of our ongoing work around uh, the, uh, uh, the COVID uh, vaccine. So uh, let me see if, we can, if I can set this up so you can see John as well as me. Okay, that's going to be, yeah. Um, and so this is an experiment. We just thought we would invite uh, those of you who are following us and some of you we know are coming for, you know, so are coming every time, are really um, uh, dedicated and loyal followers. We appreciate that. Just wanted to give you a behind-the-scenes peek um, at what we're going to be doing with uh, John. So over to you, John. Hi, everybody. Radar. Great to see you again. Welcome back to The Learning Hack. Uh, last time we spoke, I, th I think you've been on twice before. Um, so a serial offender. Uh, last time we spoke was in May of 2020, when the true scope of the global pandemic was becoming horribly apparent, and you were mobilizing health professionals through your organization, the Geneva Learning Foundation, to share learning and education across borders and boundaries to help beat it. A year on now, we're in the throes of getting the world vaccinated with some sort of end in sight. Can you describe the journey you and your organization have been on this last year? So, the, yeah, the funny thing is, I think what, you know, happened to us <laughs> is what happened to everyone else. Uh, um, and having worked for a long time in disaster management, um, in humanitarian response, having had the personal experience of facing a previous pandemic, um, you know, I did what everyone else does in those situations is you, tr you see, you, you figure out how resilient you are often without having to think about it and you figure out how to learn faster than, uh, than you ever have. So that's a personal level. My organization, the Geneva Learning Foundation went through the same, you know, the same throws that every organization went through. So it's it's completely exceptional and mundane at the same time. In our case, we were in the middle of building the um, uh, the Teach to Reach program, and um, what that you know, um, this was a program with more than three thousand participants in over ninety countries, uh, figuring out how immunization training um, was going to um, could be improved. And the irony is that even though we're fully digital, we focused, we chose deliberately to focus on face-to-face -face training because we felt that in immunization, in the field of immunization, the face-to-face -face training event is still the norm and offering some fancy digital framework and so on would be beside the point, would be premature. <laughs> yes, uh, well, so you were wrong, as wrong-footed as everybody else exactly. by having to <laughs> yes. suddenly take everything digital. That's really interesting, right? <laughs> Um, and at the same time, we were ready because everything we do is digital, doesn't rely on face-to-face -face interactions, doesn't, doesn't presume that physical encounters are superior to remote digital ones. Um, and so we called on, I think it's around sort of, we took a long time actually, it's like mid-April, we issue a call where we say to people, guess what, on our immunization platform. And at the time it looks like, you know, I remember... You know, the, uh, 1984, the announcement on the White House lawn in the United States, um, the, you know, the, the, the chief of the health services or whatever, the, basically the, the American the Minister of Health, yeah. yeah, saying, making an announcement, we will have a vaccine within six months. And then 30 years later, I remember working as, a, as an <laughs> activist in the trenches and remembering that and recalling that overly optimistic 
pronouncements, you're being actually quite a quite misleading and quite hurtful and damaging. And so I had the mm. same reaction when I heard pronouncements about and predictions about <laughs> yes, uh, that a that a COVID nineteen vaccine could suddenly appear. Um, and uh, so we worked on that basis. We worked on the basis that there would be no vaccine. That this was about prevention and information. All right. And um, and at the same time, so we built what turned into the COVID-19 Peer Hub, building on the impact accelerator work that you and I have done, have discussed in the past. Mm. Um, and we did it uh, with immunization professionals from all over the world. And at the time, there were 80 million children being placed under threat, not because of COVID directly, but because of a consequence of the restrictions on, on the on the on movement because of the fears and misinformation uh, caregivers basically literally just stopped bringing their children for vaccines so vaccines mm-hmm. off uh, you know children off of vaccine schedules means children at risk from vaccine preventable diseases and basically potentially dying stupid deaths <laughs> yes, uh, so there was both like a there's a, <laughs> a tremendously interesting learning and knowledge problem with respect to our mission um, and we focused everything we had on that just like many other organizations <laughs> in, the, in the middle of uh, you know uh, of this and we realized that actually the work we had been doing in immunization now since 2016 um, mm. You know, all of a sudden, towards the end of the year, we realized that what we were doing, our work, was potentially of interest to everyone. It always mm. had been. Public health is about, you know, the protection of everyone. But all of a sudden, there was more intense interest um, and um, resources, um, concentration, you know, on immunization than there has ever been before, perhaps since the yeah. big, I don't know, polio campaigns in the 50s or, you know, the, in the previous century or something like that. Mm. But then, like everything else, COVID turned that, a lot of that on its head because it wasn't children that were necessarily the, the, the focus here. It was kind of older people and who, 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 who COVID was really kind of targeting and those are the people that had to be protected. Where I, I know previous immunisation campaigns have all been about children. I remember as a child in the 50s getting, um, uh, getting immunised. So there was a turnaround there as well? Absolutely. I mean, there's a whole you know, debate amongst immunization experts, which I think mm. has some implications for just, uh, learning professionals and, and learning leaders um, around what that change means. My understanding is in the mm. past, attempts to, introdu- uh, to introduce vaccines that were not for children, so say for adolescent girls, for a human papillom, a virus, uh, papilloma virus, HPV, mm-hmm. um, you know, have run into problems and um, and have been challenge, you know, have been more challenging than other vaccines. Um, and at the same time, there's a yeah, there's this is where I think the lens of learning uh, and leadership are especially relevant. What we've seen in the last since November when we started to do scenario planning around vaccine introduction. So this is a network, the largest platform of immunization professionals in the world in developing countries. Yes, uh, and it mm. is about not only us sending information you know to people, but it is about people connecting uh, to each other. And what's interesting from a learning perspective is in the face of a challenge of that implies fairly radical changes in competencies and knowledge and skills and behavior and, uh, and in how you think about your role, we saw that same, yeah, that same sort of motivation and that can-do attitude making a tremendous difference. And it also mm-hmm. turned out, uh, what, <laughs> one other observation, uh, François Gass, uh, uh, a friend and a, a legend in the world of immunization, um, he would basically enter a country and 12 to 18 months later there would be no more tetanus. Tetanus would be eradicated. Um, mm. And he bemoaned the fact that in the country where he lives, um, COVID-19 vaccine, uh, uh, vaccination efforts are extremely slow. Um, and he speaks with you know, um, colleagues in uh, Francophone West Africa and other parts of Africa where, um, that have actually more experience, more know-how with campaigning, with setting up large, uh, massive vaccination campaigns than people you know, in the in the affluent in the more affluent countries do so. Yeah. There's some really interesting paradoxes in terms and and some of the assumptions about like who knows what, <laughs> and how we know what we know um, about epist- epistemology that uh, that are being challenged, um, and that if the global community 
you know, recognizes the significance of those could be, you know, could lead to a change in the, some of the prevailing paradigms around how we think about learning um, and leadership in the field of immunization. And I think that change in paradigm is absolutely essential if COVID-19 vaccine introduction is to be, you know, successful in actually protecting all populations everywhere uh, from uh, the coronavirus. So a lot of paradoxes and ironies in, in that whole situation. Um, so the, the, the story has been one of, okay, the, the, the resources are available, um, all the work gets accelerated, uh, the rug's pulled under from your feet um, in certain respects in that what you're facing now is not necessarily what you faced in the past and so on. Can you explain a bit about the, the mechanism that has evolved over, over the year to to deal with that situation. Um, specifically, can you explain how you work within the ACT-A mechanism and COVAX, C-O-V-A-X, and maybe explain to start with what both of those are? Sure, so I think, so in the past you had, um, say the United Nations system, which is the member states, um, and things were simple then. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, knowledge and learning would trickle up to the you know to the body tasked with compiling and summarizing the best available knowledge and expertise. Member states would then adopt that as the recommendation, and countries would then command and control top down, carry out those uh, and implement those recommendations. Obviously, we live in a far more complex world, and there's a long history over several decades of you know sort of the way catalytic the role played by catalytic philanthropy the creation of sort of these bodies that are actually networks you know uh, that are beginning sort of networks of institutions and i would say that's what the um, you know the uh, the covax which is focused on vaccine delivery and then the act which is you know the, the it's this ma machinery at the international level connected to countries um, that is not quite so top down or command and control as um, as as things used to be in the past. Now, where we fit in is that you know these sort of existing these remain primarily top down approaches towards the shared goal of <laughs> uh, of um, yeah fighting the pandemic, um, eradicating the coronavirus once and for all would be nice. Would be a nice to, you know would be a uh, the cherry on top. Um, and so we believe this goal will be strengthened if it's strengthened by uh, more cross-cutting or bottom-up or you know, call it what you will, peer and action learning opportunities for national and subnational staff to learn from and support each other. So these are mm -hmm. the people who are actually delivering the vaccines. And yes, they haven't necessarily delivered vaccines for adults in the past, but now they have to. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. And um, there's some, you know, so, so that's where we situate ourselves, we're, you know, we're both sort of, we believe that there's real power in connecting people on the ground who are delivering vaccines with that international machinery, which is otherwise quite disconnected in a peculiar way mm. from like, you know, so in a way, you know, probably deaf and maybe blind to a lot of the on the ground uh, activities and all of the sort of, big data and, you know, so sort of uh, AI for uh, public health, digital health, um, all of that stuff only works if uh, the people on the ground, the people who deliver vaccines are actually involved and recognized not just as sort of sources of data or data points, but recognized for their leadership, for their talent, and for their potential to sort of grow that talent and leadership to face up to these, uh, to these challenges. So we see ourselves increasingly as sort of building that bridge between the, the different levels of a system. And we've seen in small but significant ways because of the scale we work at, um, how much of a difference when those levels are connected to each other in the right way. So not an extractive um, mining exercise, not a condescending you know, so sort of bit of tourism to validate what you think needs to be done or to sort of, um, you know, to, to, to validate your, poli your existing policies, but to actually question your governing values. So what uh, Argyra is called double loop learning um, yeah. is not only about listening, but is actually being ready to reframe and rethink how you're listening, why you're listening, what you will do with what you hear. Um, those are the kinds of things where, where we're, you know, we see ourselves increasingly as advocates for, for the type of learning that is, mostly absent from the other spaces uh, that exist within immunization. 
Yes, and that leads us on to uh, another theme of, of, of your work. That I, I know that leadership is a particular focus of yours. Um, can you talk a little about leadership in the context of COVID and uh, especially vaccination? So I think of, of someone like uh, some of the leaders at the global level and what that leadership actually means. Um, I think, you know, and then I think about the people that we interact with every day in our, in our programs, remarkable individuals who are working in a health facility in the district, uh, maybe in the capital city and the national team responsible for, uh, for immunization. Um, and I actually observed the same dynamics of sort of you know, um, striving to be more than what you are in order to achieve, in order to learn, in order to uh, respond and adapt to the challenges posed by the uh, uh, by the pandemic. And I'm sure there's stuff that's going to keep anthropologists, you know, other social scientists busy for decades in terms of sort of the consequences and how people have you know have adapted and so on, but. Um, from that knowledge and learning perspective, you know, it really feels like knowledge, like who owns it, what is the knowledge that matters, how we know what we know, has just kind of broken free from its moorings, from its shackles. Um, and, you know, um, there's a, you know, the, the way if you think about this information from a learning perspective, you know, like if you're an instructional designer, you're designing the COVID-19 vaccine delivery program. <laughs> yes, uh, when, how does misinformation fit into that? How do you respond to it? How do you recognize like where what its sources are and what are the effective responses? Um, you know that that those are the questions that um, that I see these leaders from the local to the global levels, and we're talking with people from all those levels. Um, are all kind of like instructional designers now. <laughs> yes. Uh, mm. And uh, just like a lot of instructional designers, finding that the tools that date from the previous century of, you know, figure out what the learning objectives are, uh, develop the set of activities and then assessments that will measure whether people have achieved those learning objectives. I mean, it's not that those are no longer valid principles, but they're certainly not sufficient to actually solve the problems at hand. Uh, so we're seeing people being challenged and growing incredibly quickly as a, you know, as a result. I think I'm convinced there's a new, basically a new generation of immunization leaders that is you know, emerging, that is going to emerge from this baptism by fire that is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, I do see also you know, um, a resistance to behavior change. You know, um, mm. especially at the at the so-called higher levels of the system, so global and regional levels, of people who actually, even in the face of such a crisis, would rather keep doing things the way they have been doing them. And again, yeah. from a, that learning and leadership perspective, that resistance to change is to be expected. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, change is hard. Um, and I actually think the learning sciences have more than a few things to offer to help people at all levels in leading that change. Um, yeah. And that's what we're focusing <coughs> on now. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to potentially show how outdated my knowledge of leadership theory is now. But the, the last time I kind of dipped into it as an area, uh, there was something called situational leadership, um, which meant that when you're managing steady state, you would um, lead in a certain way. When a crisis hit, you would move to perhaps a more directive style. And it's interesting what you say because it, it, it seems that here we are trying to um, trying to pe people are trying to lead in a crisis, uh, and yet it is the people or the countries with the more directive styles that seem to have suffered worse. In other words, you know, countries where the the, the focus is managing the message rather than actually getting down to the grassroots and making things happen in the in the in the, in the kind of way you're talking about. Is there a kind of is that just really old-fashioned thinking, but or is the the the, the crisis inspiring a, a change in how we think about leadership in a crisis? I have no idea. Good question. <laughs> yeah, I have no <laughs> idea. I it's it feels like too early. We're still reeling from, and I think that the the sort of process of reflection and analysis, you know, uh, um, and how you interpret. You know, like how different governments, the different decision-making processes and the consequences resulting from it. Um, what things, it feels like, you know, there's some, 
you know, claims, many claims about what is happening um, yeah. and what it means. You know, the, the distinction, say, the focus on women leaders, you know, whose countries are, in some cases, seem to be doing better, you know, by what, you know, by what measure or the claim that well, authoritarian people pushed back against that. And they said, you know, Belgium has a, a woman leader and has done really badly. So, yeah, I, I think unpacking that. And I do think that, I mean, so sure, there's there's lots of, you know, leadership in like that L&D space is, you know, very convoluted, trying to get at something that whose effects are long term, but having mm -hmm. to sell a short term elixir if the consultant or the, yes, uh, the company or the academic researcher wants the job or the grant or whatever it is. So I think there's a, you know, I, I, we're thinking we're trying to, to understand and sort of build a leadership framework based on our practice. Uh, we've looked at, say, the adaptive leadership framework, for example, and, um, you know, these two Harvard professors who, you know, say basically, you know, leadership is about your capacity, how, how, how quickly you can adapt. Um, it's not about how strong or how, you know, what resources you have, but it's really that capacity for adaptation. We've looked at, you know, there's all kinds, um, but what we're seeing is undeniably, you know, these, these dynamics of very rapid change that don't seem to be slowing down um equal and opposite resistance <laughs> to that uh to the to that change at all levels and what we're seeing though is people we work with people i work with every day and and uh and appreciate and enjoy uh, you have sort of enjoy interacting with while aware of the challenges they're facing in their daily work in delivering vaccines um mm. really a kind of coming to consciousness that you only see in crises that is hard to produce by other means you know this is the crisis the relationship between crisis and opportunity is something that's sort of well theorized well fairly well understood in um in humanitarian response or disaster management or even humanitarian health i think in learning and leadership there's that focus on you know the the, the ceo that's uh, that faces a crisis that threatens the company um this is the the sort of organic and existential nature of this one. I'm expecting that through our practice, we're going to gain new understandings of those dynamics, what they mean, and then we'll be able to figure out how to foster, you know, support, encourage um, certain certain you know what we see as constructive, as positive, as leading to actual change and measurable impact. Um, but it's way too early for me to say anything more than you know to, to if I you know to be candid and to say anything else would be dishonest. I have no idea, <laughs> and that, that's been a recurring theme in the last year or so. I think so refreshing to to hear a guest who will admit he has no <laughs> idea. Um, I mentioned an end in sight at the beginning of this interview, but although there's more optimism about in richer nations at least and those that have managed to get vaccination going quicker, uh, it's far from over. It, you know, if you looked at the UK sort of um, take on the whole thing, generally it's like, oh, let's get back to normal, let's go to, go to pop festivals, let's get down the pub, all the rest of it. Um, but when you look at the rest of the world, there are huge challenges still. In India, currently, people are dying at the rate of 4,000 a week, I think. That's official figures. It could be an undercount, could be much higher. And each new variant seems to raise fresh fears. You know, suddenly the, the Indian variant comes up and everybody's, oh, my God, maybe it's not really over. Are we learning fast enough in this crisis, in your view? Um, and also, how do you see the way forward? Yeah, so on the uh, on the first question is a little <laughs> easier to to answer than the um, you know the, the the broader second. I mean, on the specific. So no, we're not learning fast enough. Uh, we, you know, um, and that resistance to change. You know, the um, and specifically your know, behavior change by you know within the global community. Um, you know what we're seeing is that. There are new ways to learn, um, new, you know, sort of, that could provide the global immunization community with tools to accelerate that learning. Uh, however, um, that immunization space is mired in this legacy of, 
actually that where innovation was not needed. You did not learn need to learn too fast for a long time. It's one of a few development interventions, uh, uh, and I may have said this in the previous uh, uh, in the previous yeah. exchange we had. You know, it's one of a few development interventions that just worked. You know, top down uh, command and control. You line up the kids in the in the uh, village, and they're, oh, they stop dying from stupid diseases. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, so that one concern is just sort of if the realization that there's certainly the realization and the awareness that there's a need to learn faster and better. Um, but what concerns me is whether the, you know, so whether the, the, the members of that global community um, are willing to you know, sort of explore what double loop learning implies in terms of changing their behaviors, in terms of rethinking the frameworks on which they operate, in terms of how they spend their time, who they listen to. Uh, so really thinking their learning and their leadership um, and seeing that, understanding that that is one of the keys that could make the difference between, you know, uh, between success and failure in vaccine introduction. Um, on the second question, the, the way forward, I mean, you know, um, there are real real scary risks um, of that are actually in part consequences of that resistance to change. And even in the face of the opportunity to change ways, change how we lead, change how we come to know, um, you know, that, that's, <laughs> that do keep me awake at night. You know, um, mm -hmm. my concern is that some of the people, uh, some of whom have become friends, some of whom I know, you know, even though we've never met in a physical space, uh, I know and trust and consider to be almost like family who are doing this remarkable job on the ground of actually delivering vaccines, actually following everything that the international community is throwing at them and asking them to do what their Ministry of Health is asking them to do. Um, I'm afraid of waking up one morning and seeing on the one of the telegram groups that we have um, where we're getting this constant stream of information that you know, uh, somebody was attacked by people you know, nourished by misinformation, by um, not by ignorance, but actually <laughs> yes, uh, uh, people who figured out how to use very effective ways to learn to nefarious ends or, mm -hmm. you know, reading or, or hearing that uh, a testimonial from someone who says that their health facility was attacked or burned down, um, you know, as, as, you know, and so I think there's a real sense of responsibility and I do believe that the learning sciences, the tools of learning. Um, if we're willing ourselves as learning leaders to abandon <laughs> that vestigial legacy of uh, of training of the old ways that of, uh, that have led us in many cases to to, to a dead end, um, and sort of embrace the new and the unknown and be willing to take the risks and to navigate those unknowns, convince learning sciences and you um, uh, or organizations that practice learning can actually make. A tremendous contribution like it, it may turn out that you know, uh, figuring out better faster ways to learn rethinking how we come to know uh, is actually one of the keys to you know um, you know in the long term uh, not only ending this pandemic but preventing the next ones interesting good good answer and it, and it makes me think that um uh COVID-19, a virus like COVID-19 is something that learns very quickly. This is what the new variants are all about, isn't it? It learns that um, it needs to change very rapidly in order to continue spreading. Um, that's kind of what we're up against. And we, we have to be the uh, as smart, um, as adaptive uh, as that. Thank you, Rada. I Now almost for sort of bonus content, I think, as far as my podcast is is concerned um because i've kind of done the interview that I, I wanted to do with you just is it could we spend um you know just a couple of minutes talking about for those who are really into the theory of learning and i know a lot of people on my podcast are you mentioned double loop learning i know you're very influenced by uh victoria marsick and karen e. watkins work on learning as work working as learning can you talk about the implications in in what you've seen for the the you know just that kind of theoretical side of how we learn? I yeah, so I, I can try. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> yes, and this is the absolutely. geeky stuff that yeah I deeply care about and and that we're constantly in our team, you know, sort of saying okay, well, what does this actually mean in practice? 
so you know my view is that the sort of stuff around learning organizations, the fifth discipline, you know, um, I think were attempts at sort of formulating things in terms that practitioners could put to use, and they failed with that. I would say, and I, you know, this is polemical and deliberately so, I think you've seen me as a speaker right in this way before, um, the stuff around 70, 20, 10, not only is it bogus nonsense, but just not backed up by evidence, but it's also like, I haven't seen, other than people putting up posters saying 70, 20, 10 on, on them, I haven't actually seen practical application. And I know some zealots will, will come back and say, and I hope they do and get interested in the podcast as a result, that some zealots will say 70, 20, 10 change my learning practice and transform my organization. But I, I would want to see, you know, I, wouldn't I, I don't believe that. Um, the double loop learning and, you know, um, is really of interest because of that interest of uh, something that is often neglected in learning, and that's the values part, you know, and the sort of what governs those values. You know, um, and so when you think about change in organizations, um, whether they're for-profit entities or whether they're, yes, uh, non-profits, there's a lot of talk around mission. Um, you know, every organization claims to have a, a mission focus. Um, hmm. and Purpose, they talk about nowadays. More often. Okay, <laughs> thanks. And um, and so... That, Same thing, but... Yeah, that mission or purpose is about values, but I don't see that uh, you're stated explicitly, much less see you know, actions or activities taken in that direction. So for us, it's an interesting focus. We just had a, uh, we just had a, a discussion um, with one of our partners... And we actually asked her, you know, well, so tell us, what is, what do you mean by double loop learning? Because within her organization, there's a number of people who are saying, okay, we need to do double loop learning now. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so we asked, um, actually, Karen Watkins, who's worked, you know, uh, who's done a lot of research around it. And we said, well, you know, would you be interested in hearing how a learning scientist <laughs> defines it? And there's a bit of a discomfort, actually. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, <laughs> you mean if we talk about you know double loop learning, we should be interested in learning science? So that there's that disconnect between evidence and you know sort of what people do with you know learning branding, you know, the, the sort of terminology or fads or fashion. And then what what she the way she described it was quite different from the way Karen described it. And I have okay. problems with both. Karen said, um, it's, you know, when you're willing to question the framework and the design of your training as part of a feedback process, you know, as opposed to just asking, did the, you know, were people happy? Did they apply the learning? You're also questioning the training itself. Um, mm -hmm. And I disagree with that because I think that's a very narrow view. You know, our whole, all of our work is focused on what happens beyond the learning intervention. You're shifting our focus from learning outcomes to actual you know, that whole continuum from knowledge development um, to, you know, to application to measurement. Um, and our partner said, well, we just need to inform, we just need sort of new inputs, innovative ideas to inform our policies and guidelines. Um, and that can't be, I mean, that doesn't actually question anything about your practice or your values or how you operate. It just means you want to extract some information because you recognize that the existing pyramid of channels that you have available doesn't give you, you uh, innovative uh, inputs and you recognize there's a gap there. But maybe that gap is there for deeper reasons that have to do with your practice, with the values that govern your behavior. Um, and that was, it was, I mean, it's like a two, not, you know, Two parallel, two parallel lines, uh, neither of which I see as leading to a productive place, a constructive place, still mm -hmm. mired in the training view on, one, uh, on the one hand, on so the sort of training as a container um, in a hyper-connected world doesn't make sense. And then with, um, with our partner, um, you know, seeing, well, we just want some additional, some new inputs but not recognizing the system that as it exists, that prevents those inputs from getting to you at the global level and not recognizing that, you know, the, the sort of, we're not measuring really the, uh, the implications uh, that would lead you to question how you behave, how you think and how you come to know, you know, that's, so, that's what I saw. So those inputs would also have outputs. My, my perhaps crude understanding of double loop learning would be that, okay, you um, set off with an intention and a purpose to do something. And um, from the learnings you get from back from the feedback to what you do, you then 
very often have to go back and, and reframe the question that you were asking. So you're saying that you're, you're talking about this as having a very, uh, very wide impact in the that reframing will impact on your values. You might need to rethink about your values based on on what you learn. Is that right? Yes. And that resistance to change with you is, I think that's the scariest part of all. So you're mm. willing to, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that are sort of within reach in terms of our capacity for change. Like if you work at the global level in an international organization and you are, um, you know, uh, and you recognize that the existing means you have are not delivering the results that you, you know, say the member states, governments have asked you to achieve. Mm. Um, so it's really a question of like, what is the, where is the frontier of what you're willing to question uh, and what, you know, and how much you're willing to change that capacity for change. And again, the best tools we have you know, to, to support human beings in um, improving their, you know, their capacity for change and changing their capacity for change. Well, that's, you know, those are the tools of, of, of uh, learning, distinguishing the archaic ones from the ones that actually, you know, sort of fit for purpose in the, in the complex world we, uh, um, we live in. But that, you know, we're actually putting together sort of, we're trying to think through now, what does the design look like for a learning system that will foster behavior change. Because again, it's just like any kind of behavior change. You can't just tell someone at the global level, you need to change your ways and they will do it. <laughs> yes, uh, You need to yeah. stop condescending to uh, people who deliver vaccines in countries while paying lip service to them. You know, that, that you can't, it's not putting up a poster. <laughs> yes, uh, certainly communication approaches fail. Learning approaches, um, I think we're trying to figure out what are the right ones that would help that you know, technical officer in a large established international organization, you know, um, uh, actually change their behavior and contribute to organizational change with the COVID nineteen peer hub that we built last year. Um, you know, we were able to. I mean, it's not us; it's thousands of people in countries who deliver vaccines who came together to create the COVID nineteen peer hub uh, to develop new knowledge to share ideas across countries, borders, assist, you know, systems, um, different parts of the health system. Who then use that knowledge um, to develop action planning. Who then supported each other, challenged each other to achieve. You know, those action plans which were to help immunization services recover you know um, but what we saw is um, we invited we regularly invite global partners and one who's a brilliant epidemiologist um, you know brilliant um, yeah global public health specialist and mm. uh, she came away saying this was so inspiring you know, and this is so because there were powerful compelling testimonials that she would never hear any other place in her daily work Mm. Um, and inspiring actually misses the point. So yes, I mean, I was inspired too. I, you know, in some cases I'm like, yeah, I can feel the emotions are very strong and it's remarkable that we're able to do that across, you know, to defy distance, to share those emotions. That is significant, but that can't be it. You know, that, that, that part of figuring out people sort of tapping into their inner motivation, into why they wake up in the morning and go to work. So maybe it's for a paycheck, but what we found is in immunization, there's something in most people, you know, that is you know, somewhere you wake up every day because you don't want children to die stupid deaths from vaccine preventable diseases or now, and you're now in a position, literally, you know, immunization is the most likely prospect for you know, uh, saving the world uh, from mm. the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And that is actually key not only to inspiration, but to public health, to actually doing good public health, actually delivering results. That motivation is consistently just a key factor, a key determinant, a key driver of being able to de deliver results. So that's one instance where I realized the depth of change, like how could a brilliant epidemiologist only see listening to this listening to what people in countries are actually doing how they're actually doing it and come away just feeling inspired which is wonderful but it's also a way of saying okay that's a nice rah-rah event that is mm. not the real work the business you know and so we find ourselves in the predicament again that uh, yes uh, learning professionals often find themselves in saying that somehow what they do is kind of interesting you know, uh, but not directly connected to the global goals to the outcomes and so on and uh, everything we do is built around achieving the outcomes 
and collecting mm. and measuring the evidence for that. Uh, so that disconnect is profound and we're still struggling with it. Um, with the pandemic, it's like, you know, it's, um, yeah, we feel increasingly thinking in terms of fractals, like, you know, like every little part of the system that we, where we try to think about what does the change look like is part of a mm. broader system where you get to ask those questions again and again and again yep. and again. Turtles all the way down. Yep. yep. I think it's a really interesting analysis. I, I think I can't let you go without standing up slightly for 70, 20, 10, um, <laughs> because we've had Charles Jennings on the, the podcast and I, I, I talked to him at, at length about him and I re, he's somebody I really respect and admire. I think at least it's had one good effect in learning and development, which is to kind of crowbar people out of a mindset that is focused on formal learning interventions and to to look more at informal, social, to, to, you know, a, a wider, to, to, to reframe L&D uh, with a wider focus. And I think 702010 really did have that effect. And, you know, you're, you're, you're right that the, the kind of, the, there are problems with the statistical base, research basis for it. There isn't an awful lot there. But I think it's been a useful idea, hasn't it? Um, I, I would agree with that, but uh, only to the extent that, so 70 20, 10 was a discovery for me personally in my journey. You know, that was like, yeah. and it was like coming to consciousness. Oh, okay. So you know, maybe we, yeah, there's something no. you know, uh, other than formal, tra formal training. Um, but then I think that basically, you know, most, if not all of sort of learning frameworks, some were more successful. There's a kind of an ecosystem of you know, frameworks and, uh, and increasingly complex ones and ones being sort of, they're competing with each other. Um, I think mm. though, even the ones that are like, uh, that don't withstand scrutiny are still a useful heuristic, you know, like yeah. stirring reflection, helping us think about and reflect on our practice. And I mean, somebody somewhere has put time and energy into trying to organize like and make sense of, you know, so that's what, theory is, uh, is about how do we make sense of the world? And so, yeah, I definitely would respect and honor everyone as a learning professional who's trying to think and reflect on their practice. And I think it's, yeah, uh, if you want to remain a learning professional, that is now a necessity. Whereas in the past, perhaps in the distant past that I never, uh, ne certainly never got to know personally, you could just, you know, so order the, you know, uh, develop the trainings, uh, fill up the bums in seats, count the number of seats, uh, send out your smile sheet and, um, and collect a check at the end of each month. I think those days are long gone. Um, and that, that necessity for constantly thinking, reflecting, uh, and, you know, sort of mis a, a mishmash, figuring out which mishmash of frameworks, um, you know, theories, evidence, like for your specific needs in your context, what are you going to pull together that will convince your leadership, that will, uh, that will motivate your uh, people in your, in your team, that, you know, that alchemy, um, I think, is a, is a kind of key responsibility for any learning leader today, whatever the context, whether you're fighting COVID or trying to figure out how to sell, you know, fizzy water with sugar, lots of sugar in it. Hmm. Um, talking to you, Raider, is always great. It's never fizzy water with lots of sugar in it. It's, um, it's a heady brew, I think I have to say. Um, so thank you very much for appearing on The Learning Hack today. Thank you, John. Uh, let's have a round of applause. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, and I want to thank um, Ayurinde Margaret, uh, Mohamed Umar Sakwa, um, Ismail Aydogo, and other folks who've been listening in. Uh, this is the recording uh, for uh, John's podcast. We'll be sharing the links so you can listen to the actual podcast. Uh, John, do you want to say anything? Any, do you have a teaser for that podcast? Because I'm one of two guests, right? And the other one is, uh, is far more uh, well-known uh, uh, and of general interest uh, than the very specialized geeky learning stuff we care about. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, you know, very different. The, the other guest is head of global talent. I think I'm getting his um, job title right for AstraZeneca, Mark Howes. And he talks about the, the challenges that organization's been through um, over the last year i think what one, one the only other thing i'd like to add is, is the date of publication for this for this podcast episode so i'm 
I have to apologize in advance here, Radar. I'm calling it learning on the jab. <laughs> okay. And, and it comes out on the 21st of June. Okay. So, so put that in your calendars. Indeed. Thank you, John. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radar. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.